Hello, my name is Jeff Hoffman. I'm a professor of aerospace engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Prior to coming here, I spent 19 years as a NASA astronaut making five flights in the space shuttle. Most uh, significant mission was the repair of the Hubble Space Telescope. I've always been interested in astronomy, science fiction. 2001 is one of my all-time favorite science fiction movies, and I encourage you to come and have a look at it. you got to see it on the big screen, and that's what I hope you'll be able to do. When I go to see science fiction movies, uh, of course, as, as a former astronaut, uh, I, I know a lot about the technology of space flight, and, and I always pay attention to how realistic is this. Uh, some movies make attempts to be realistic. Others don't really care that much about it. They just care about having a good story and good visual effects. Uh, to their credit, with 2001, they did as good a job as was possible, given the technology at the time, of making it realistic. I mean, some of those scenes up on the space station where people are, are have Velcro shoes and they're, they're sort of walking around that passage, and um, they, they really, I think, did an excellent job of creating a sense of weightlessness where it was significant, of showing the scenes on the moon. Um, they didn't, this was before we actually flew by the outer planet, so they didn't really have a high fidelity picture of, of Jupiter, Saturn, or, um, and, and so that was not quite as realistic as it could be done today. But nevertheless, I, I think, you know, basically the, both the science that was used and the visuals were very well done. And you have to make some allowances for the fact that it was done back in the 1960s. So, you know, 50 years ago, we've got a lot better computer-generated images now and, and things. But it, it's amazing what Kubrick was able to do in that movie back in the late 60s. I have to say, right now, and, and this was even before the current administration took over, but NASA really has been getting more serious. I think of, of the various uh, efforts that NASA has made, whether it was the Vision for Space Exploration or the Constellation program, we're farther along this time. And, and I, I think there's a, you know, both from a technical and, and a political point of view, um, I certainly hope it's going to happen. Now, Congress has not given NASA the money that NASA says it really needs if we're going to meet the administration's request to get the next uh, mission to the moon in 2024. They talk about the first woman and the next man on the moon. Now, after 30 years of shuttle, where we really developed a mastery of operations in low Earth orbit. We learned to do incredible things with spacewalking, you know, repairing the Hubble Space Telescope, building the International Space Station. And we're ready to let the commercial sector take over a lot of the operations in low Earth orbit. And so it's really NASA's responsibility to push the boundary and, and to go further. And what's exciting about it this time, and, and really may make all the difference, is, is that there is a huge uh, interest among the commercial space companies in being a part of going back to the moon and someday going to Mars. I mean, we have Elon Musk building this huge starship, which he, he says he wants to use that to take uh, 100 people at a time to live on Mars and actually set up a permanent habitation, a, a essentially a... Um, a village on Mars. Um, it, it's rather extraordinary. This last decade, we've had a generation of billionaires who are space nuts. You know, it's been 50 years since we landed on the moon. When I talk to my students now about the Apollo program, I have to keep reminding myself, you know, for them, it's ancient history. 
Do I think that it's going to happen? I think we have the best chance of making it happen. Um, Congress ultimately has to provide some money, but we also have money coming in from the private sector now. So ultimately, if NASA doesn't do it, you know, maybe Jeff Bezos will be the first person to get us to Mars or Elon Musk. I don't really care who does it. I just want to see some people exploring space again. And I hope it's going to happen. I think we have a good chance. People often ask about the personality of astronauts, you know, when they ask astronauts to describe the view out the window of a spacecraft and, and you know, all many people can come up with it, oh, it sure is beautiful, it's uh, magnificent, um, and, and then people say, well, why can't we send some poets up there? Well, you, you know, you have to remember, uh, flying a spaceship, it's a very dangerous thing, particularly in the early days of, of space travel. Nobody knew how to do these things, and I, I guess it was, um, the story is it was President Eisenhower when we first set up NASA and, and made the commitment that we were going to send people into space. He recognized that you better send test pilots because this is an unknown, and that's what test pilots are meant to do. And, and certainly the early days of the astronaut office, it was a test pilots organization. And you don't select test pilots by their poetic abilities uh, you know, to talk about things. Things changed radically when the space shuttle came along because the space shuttle had a crew of seven and you only needed two pilots. That's really what gave me a chance to be an astronaut because I, you know, before that I, I was always fascinated with space flight and always thought, yeah, it'd be great to go up in a rocket and, you know, I dreamed about it when I was a little kid, but I had no desire to join the military and become a, a pilot. I was interested in science. I, I became a professional astrophysicist. But when NASA announced that the shuttle was getting ready to start flying and they needed some new astronauts, and by the way, they, they yes, they still need some pilots, but they also want scientists, engineers, medical doctors, and that's when I applied, and I was fortunate enough to get accepted. And, and so the population of the astronaut corps has changed. And um, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of people now who are, are I think, much more articulate than the traditional picture of, of what an astronaut was. Uh, and I think it's really important. I mean, it, I have to say, being in space is such an extraordinary experience. Um, very hard to share experiences that are so different. I mean, we, we try to talk about it, but language is based on shared experience. And how do you explain to somebody what it's like really to be weightless? I mean, imagine trying to explain to um, a, a Bedouin who's spent their whole life in the desert and has never seen water except maybe in a, in a drinking cup, what it's like to go scuba diving, uh, you know, words fail when you don't have the shared experience. And so it's a constant, you know, as astronauts, we have these experiences which nobody else has, and we're constantly asked to share those experiences. Um, and, and some of us are more articulate than others. I, I feel that, you know, as explorers, people who have gone into a, a new environment that, you know, so far, uh, you know, as of, of um, 2020, there have been about 570 odd people who have been in space, very small number, and we have a responsibility to try to share the experience. We try to do it through uh, photographs, through through uh, videos, and and basically in words. So, and some of us are better with words than others, but definitely, uh, I think you'll find um, many more people who would be considered articulate spoke to people for the experience of being in space than you did at the very beginning of the program when you had a much more homogeneous test pilot uh, um, population in the astronaut office. So we have a responsibility and I, I do my best to try to share the experience as best as I can with, with the other people because after all it's you people who paid for me to go up into space, right? The taxpayers' money and I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And um, 
the more I can do to share the experience and get you excited about it, the better. Putting on a spacesuit and going outside your spacecraft into the vacuum of space is its certainly the most intimate experience of, of being in space. I mean, the windows in the space shuttle are great, but, but I have to say when you're, when you're in a helmet with a wraparound visor, um, you're just immersed in space. Now, a spacesuit is, you got to think of it like a miniature spacecraft. I mean, all the function, it has to give you uh, environmental control, keep you at the right temperature, keep you at the right pressure with enough oxygen to breathe, give you communication, electrical power, and water to drink, and, and so on. And, and yet, it, it does this, um, it, it, it's basically like an anthropomorphic balloon. It's a balloon which fits around your body. Um, and, and a spacesuit doesn't want to move in the same way, like the arms of the spacesuit. I, I can do all sorts of things with my arm. The spacesuit only moves in certain particular directions. You have to learn how to use a spacesuit. The, the very first attempts at using spacesuits back in the Gemini programs were disastrous. People, they, they were getting exhausted, they, they didn't have proper handholds, they, um, and, and we were, were really worried, apparently, the, the people at NASA, you know, you know, maybe using spacesuits is, is something that we can't do. And what really changed things was developing the ability to train underwater. And you've probably seen pictures of astronauts in, in these big pools where we, that's where we do most of our practicing. And, and why does it work so well? Well, um, a spacesuit, if I were wearing a spacesuit here on the ground on, on Earth, it would weigh about 300 pounds. I, I couldn't do anything in it. It's too heavy. I could barely stand up. Um, you go in the water, and of course the spacesuit is filled with air, so it wants to float, and so you put lead weights on your chest and your arms and your legs to balance out the buoyancy, so you become what we call neutrally buoyant. You don't sink, you don't float, and you can really operate a spacesuit and it feels like it does when you're in space. And, and that was done at the very end of the Gemini program and all the Apollo astronauts trained and that's how we trained for the shuttle. My very first space flight, uh, on every shuttle flight, two astronauts were trained to use spacesuits. Uh, just in case there's an emergency or a contingency, something goes wrong, you have to go outside. We weren't actually planning to do a spacewalk on my first flight, but I, I had been trained uh, together with my partner. Well, it turned out on that flight, we launched two telecommunication satellites. That's what the shuttle was doing in the early days. One of them didn't turn on. And Mission Control came up with this plan. There was a little switch on the outside of the uh, satellite, but that was the only failure that we could do anything about because we didn't have any special equipment. We weren't planning to surface satellites. We weren't planning to go outside. But they said, well, make these special tools, and we, we made them out of some of the equipment that we had on board. And then the two of you go outside and, and attach these tools to the end of the robotic arm, and, and then the next day we'll go up and we'll use that to wiggle the little switch. When I first heard the words come up from Mission Control saying, you know, we've, we've got some ideas of what to do about this problem, and, and one, of, one of our ideas might involve a spacewalk, or an EVA as we call it, extravehicular activity. I heard that magic word EVA, and you know, the next thing everybody else in the crew was saying, nah, you know, nobody's, NASA's never done an unplanned spacewalk before, they're, they're never going to let you go outside. But sure enough, they did. And uh, so the next day, there, there we were. You know, we had practiced putting on the spacesuits. And, and so that's the, the thing. When, when you're well trained to do something, it's a good feeling. I mean, I actually felt like, hey, I know what I'm doing. Uh, this is like we did it in training. Now, being, being in space, is, it's an extraordinary experience. And it, 
physically, emotionally, intellectually, philosophically. It, it's a different world. It's almost like a different plane of existence, particularly the weightlessness. I mean, it's an experience of, of the human body that is just completely unique. I'm often asked, you know, you, you have this incredible experience. You're, you're up there in space. And then you have to come back to Earth. I mean, what what's it like? How do you, uh, how can you deal with with normal everyday life after you've had this incredible experience? Well, I'll tell you how it happens. Uh, after I had been up uh, fixing the Hubble Space Telescope, and and you know half the world was watching. They they told us that actually more people watched that mission on TV than any other NASA mission except for Apollo 11. And so all, all of our friends had seen it, all of our neighbors had seen it, everybody knew, you know, this is an incredible experience. You know, what do you do when you get back home? Well, I'll tell you what happens. I walk in the door, and the first thing my wife says to me is, oh, well, welcome home, Mr. Hubble Repairman. And by the way, when you were up fixing Hubble, the washing machine broke. Uh, so why don't you go get your toolkit and uh, fix it so we can do our laundry? And oh, and by the way, um, the grass out in the back uh, didn't know you were up in space, so it just kept on growing. And um, yeah, the lawnmower is out in the garage, so you know <laughs> that's how you get back to Earth. You know, life goes on, um, and you know what do you have at the end? Well, I, I, I have extraordinary memories and experiences of things which will be part of me for the rest of my life, but, you know, ultimately I'm, a, I'm an earthling and, and my life is here on earth. I've been very fortunate to have had the experiences I did, but um, ultimately life goes on and, and the rest of my life has, was, and, and has been and will be here on the earth.